Hello everyone and welcome to PC Retro Tech. This week's video is a little bit offbeat for the channel. We're going to be talking about the Texas Instruments TI-99 4A computer. And believe it or not, this came out in 1981 in the same year as the IBM PC, but actually preceded it by a few months. And the reason that's significant is that this is a 16-bit computer, not an 8-bit. Now before I get into all of that, we first need to get the thing working and normally this plugs into an analog television which I don't have. So I'm going to try and get it working on this VGA LCD screen in the background there. And in order to do that, I'm going to use a TV tuner card. Welcome to my kitchen drawer. Uh, so this is basically full of old cards that are going to the tip. Uh, there's old modem cards in here and network cards, basically anything that's not really useful anymore. And uh, in here there's also old television cards, and some of these are the old RF style input. Uh, they're basically for the old style television before people switched over to digital. And there's quite a few of these cards in here. Some of them have missing components or are rusted. And I'm just going to go through them until I find one that works and gives us a picture. And through the magic of television, here it is finally working. Uh, but I have to say it took a lot more effort than I was anticipating. I went through about 10 TV tuner cards in the end and most of them I couldn't find suitable drivers for or there were just a lot of spammy websites that were trying to put malware on my machine. Uh, in other cases I couldn't find software to work with those drivers. So for example Windows Media Center supports live TV but I could only get it to work with one of the cards and then there was an 8 second delay between what comes out of the computer and what's displayed on the screen. I can only guess that they're scanning the content somehow looking for uh, copyrighted material that uh, you're not allowed to see or something like this. Uh, it does warn you that uh, you won't be able to view certain kinds of protected content. Uh, so anyway, I did eventually find a card that works, but as you can see, uh, it really is uh, very grainy and it needs cleaning up. Fortunately, the software that I'm using for this uh, has an option that will help out a lot here. The software that I'm using is called Descaler. It doesn't support many TV cards, but I did find one that works with it. And uh, it's got a lot of filters which are really useful. So if you go into noise reduction, it doesn't do very much by default, but if you go into filter settings, under adaptive noise filter you see uh, noise reduction and you can set this value to about 160 and uh, this makes uh, a big difference to the picture. Uh, some other filters that seem to make a bit of difference are temporal comb and uh, also sharpness. Uh, so the end result here is certainly a lot better than what you get by default. The card that I ended up using was a Win TV card. Uh, I actually had three of these, uh, two of which didn't work. Uh, this is one of the ones that didn't work, but they all look basically the same. And uh, they also take a long time to set up. Uh, TV cards in general have software that wants to use frequencies for channels in your local area. But even though this TI-99 comes with this big modulator box, which is a PAL modulator and obviously intended for Europe, uh, it's still using a UHF channel 36, which just isn't one of the channels that's available locally. Now, you can use the, the scalar software to do a scan across the entire spectrum, but this will take maybe half an hour, and so you really want to narrow the frequency down. Now, I believe UHF channel 36 is supposed to be around about 65 megahertz, uh, but I found it pop up at around 58. Now that could be because the modulator is pretty old, uh, certainly the picture looks very rough so either one of the TV card or the modulator uh, has some issues. Uh, but it's not really clear to me which that is because I only have one setup here that actually works. Uh, everything else I tried failed. So bear that in mind if you go down this route, uh, you're going to have to get uh, probably quite a few TV cards before you find one that works. The good news is they're very cheap and people will pretty much beg you to take them off their hands. Before we get into the cartridges I have with this machine, let's just take a look at its external appearance. Uh, so the most obvious thing is this hilarious sticker here which suggests to try an Apple computer. Uh, it says two days and two nights to test. And I would guess that this was put on by the retailer to try and encourage the customer to buy something a little bit more expensive. And the reason for that would be that the price of this had to come down a lot 
uh, in order to compete in the marketplace. It started at around four or five hundred dollars, but it got down to around a hundred dollars at the end of its life. And uh, there are a number of reasons for that, uh, which we'll go into a little bit later in the video. Uh, but that's not to say that this particular unit was a flop. Uh, they actually sold 2.8 million units, uh, which is pretty impressive for the day. The keyboard is actually quite nice to use. It's a full travel keyboard. Uh, it's not very clicky, but it has a nice feel when you're typing on it. Uh, it's also very small and compact. There's no separate function keys or numeric keypad or cursor keypad. Uh, instead, you've got this function key here, and when you combine it with the numbers up the top, uh, you get various functions which are sort of written at the top here. Uh, there's also cursors on the E, S, D and X keys and uh, various other uh, punctuation symbols that have been left out and inserted instead on letter keys. Uh, this insert at the top here is actually removable, so it has the advantage that it can be replaced with a different one for different functions. Uh, but it has the disadvantage that it can be removed and damaged or destroyed. And a lot of these actually come with this missing. And I was very lucky to get one that has an original insert in here. And you can see that there are two little dots here. There's a white dot and a red dot. Uh, so the white dot corresponds to the lower uh, set of function keys here, uh, which are machine defined. And it's very difficult to use the machine without these. For example, you've got delete and insert. Uh, if you want to go back through some uh, options or uh, prep, you know redo in a game uh, or if you want to quit from a game you need to know about those uh, but there's also this red one which corresponds to the upper line which is left blank and so you can write in uh, whatever functions you want to assign to those. We'll quickly go around the outside of the machine. The on off switch here that I'm illuminating with a torch uh, is a little black slider that goes left to right and there's a little indicator led next to it uh, around the side of the machine is a sidecar expansion port and uh, one of the things that you could plug in here was a Texas Instruments speech synthesis module. Uh, so TI was quite famous for their speech synthesis. Uh, there's a little flap that folds down uh, when it's not in use. Uh, around the back here you have uh, the proprietary 4-pin power connector and uh, into this plugs uh, the cable from one huge brick of a power adapter. Uh, up here you have the cassette port, I believe. Uh, I don't actually have a cassette player. The seller who sold me this particular machine said theirs uh, wasn't working and so it wasn't part of the bundle. Uh, there's a joystick port here and there's actually another one around this side of the machine uh, in a kind of non-symmetrical location. Uh, the other port is the uh, video port here, which again has a proprietary connector. So supposedly you can plug this into SCART, and there is a very, very short uh, SCART connector with only a few centimeters. Uh, it's designed to go with a cable, but unfortunately I don't have an extension cable for this. And I tried some other cables which do actually fit, uh, but they don't actually seem to work uh, with that. And uh, so I've used the UHF modulator, which I got with the machine, uh, which does plug into here, and plugged it into my television card. Now, the uh, cartridge slot is around this front here, and uh, it has a little uh, bay over which the uh, cartridges slide, and then a spring-loaded door. Uh, unfortunately, my door is uh, a little bit dodgy and so it takes a little bit of work to manipulate it back past the uh, cartridge connector so that it will spring back up into place. Uh, but with a little bit of effort you can get it to come back up again. I've opened the machine here uh, with the utmost care and patience and the reason that I'm emphasizing that is that I purchased this from a seller who told me that it had been bought for her grandson and has not been opened or repaired uh, in the entire time that he's had it. Uh, now, uh, as I've opened it, I've discovered this marking here, October 1982, uh, which is presumably put there by the seller. It couldn't have been put there much earlier. These machines only came out in 1981. And uh, so assuming that her grandson purchased this in 1982, uh, that would mean that she must be uh, almost 100 herself. 
Uh, so I'm going to take off the shielding here uh, because I want to have a look at the CPU and graphics chip, uh, which is actually probably the most interesting part of this machine. This is the inside of the machine and I'm not even going to try and adjust this to get a better image. Uh, the cables are already under enough stress here and very fragile. Uh, just for reference, this board is normally up the other way and it has a metal RF shield over both sides and the two halves are bolted together and then there are these metal clips that go on the top and bottom. Uh, so I was very surprised to find uh, a power supply inside uh, the machine. Uh, this appears to be a power supply module and uh, given the size of the external brick uh, it's a wonder that they actually need this. Uh, but presumably it provides different voltages to the main board. Uh, so the external uh, power comes in here and then uh, it connects to the main board through this connector uh, and down here. Uh, if you do uh, try to get inside one of these, just be aware that uh, many of the screws are a bit misleading. Um, some of them are actually adjustments on the main board rather than attachment screws. Uh, also there are some bolts and as soon as you remove the bolt uh, the, the nut will fall off and you pretty much have no option but to open the machine entirely at that point uh, in order to put the nut back on. Uh, the keyboard connector is here and you can see the keyboard PCB at the back here uh, that's where that connector plugs in. Uh, the cartridge slot uh, is this thing here and it just goes through the RF shield into a connector on the main board. Uh, so the processor is here, this is the TMS9900, this is a 16-bit processor. Uh, it's quite similar to the 8086 in that sense. Uh, it only has an 8-bit data bus but is internally 16-bit. Uh, uh, the uh, chip here, the 9901, is actually a programmable uh, system interface uh, or something of that nature. It provides interrupts and I.O. Uh, and sort of paired with the processor. Uh, I'm going to assume that this is the graphics chip here, the TMS9918, and uh, I haven't been able to identify the sound chip. Uh, this is a fairly small chip, uh, and I'm going to assume that it's this one here with a heatsink, uh, but I haven't been able to verify that. Uh, certainly these will be the RAM chips. A majority of the other chips around here are actually just logic chips, uh, there's a few other specialized ones here and I don't know the function of those and I assume that these are the ROMs. Here is a close-up of the main board. Uh, I know it can be a little bit frustrating at times when videos show the inside of something but they don't give sufficient detail. Uh, so th hopefully this will help if you're interested in knowing exactly what's inside one of these and don't have access to open one up uh, for yourself. And here's a close-up of that power supply module that I was speaking about. Uh, none of the capacitors here look uh, in bad shape, thankfully, uh, but I imagine they're going to need replacing eventually. I have the machine back together now, and uh, it took about an hour and a half of effort. Uh, the keyboard connector and the cartridge connector are really quite tricky to maneuver into place. Uh, as are some of the wires, which just seem to jam things unless you get them in exactly the right way. Uh, as predicted, uh, one of the very fragile wires snapped off as I turned the board over. I probably needed to be repaired anyway because it was frayed, uh, but it took a bit of effort to resolder that. Uh, it was quite near to a bodge wire that had been added for the cassette port and quite tricky to reconnect without causing a short across the cassette port. Uh, the other thing you probably want to know about this is that the power going into this is actually 110 volts. Uh, that external transformer is just for Europe for dropping the voltage down from 240 and uh, that's why we saw the power supply inside the machine and it does have the implication that you don't want to be working on this with the power connected. Uh, there's obviously wires in there that you don't want to be touching. Anyway, I have it uh, working again and you can see that it's uh, no worse off than it was uh, when I opened it. Uh, so let's try out some of the cartridges for this so the first cartridge I'm going to play here is TI Invaders and uh, all the ROMs come up this way so you have one for the internal basic ROM and two for the cartridge. Uh, so if I select that um, this is what comes up and it, it says I can choose between merely aggressive or downright nasty. Uh, so of course I am going to select just the first option. 
uh, and it's a really playable uh, experience. It's very smooth, uh, obviously colorful graphics, and unfortunately there is no sound on this version, and I don't know why that is, whether it's something to do with my TV card, uh, or whether I have one of the mixer options set incorrectly, uh, or it might just not be working at all. Uh, there's also a possibility, of course, that this game just didn't have sound. Um, so the game itself is quite simple, and uh, I am surprised that uh, there isn't more on a cartridge. Um, so looks like I can now shoot at the yellow UFO, which is worth extra points, but I think I'm going to miss him. Oh, I got him. So, uh, yeah, it's really a bit surprising that uh, there's so little to this. Uh, you'd expect there to be more for your money, but uh, this is 1981. This is a German cartridge uh, called Schachmeister, and uh, that just means chess master. Uh, so basically, you just enter the move that you want to make. So, for example, I could do D7 to uh, D5, and then it will move the pieces for you. Uh, so it's just a simple chess game uh, on cartridge. Uh, I guess that this is a little bit more involved uh, to program something like this. Uh, but you can see that it's pretty basic graphics uh, and again no sound. This is Car Wars. Uh, unfortunately the filtering that I'm using here is making some of the text a bit hard to read but it does say press a key to begin. Unfortunately when I do that it just hangs so I think this particular cartridge is actually faulty. Uh, so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to show you uh, this particular one. This is Munchman and uh, unfortunately I've had to detune the tuner just a little bit uh, so that some of the characters will show up here. So you're the green um, man in the middle. Uh, I guess it's some kind of Pac-Man clone, but the problem I have with this game is just uh, the speed at which everything happens. Uh, you press the keys and uh, it's basically all over immediately. And a number of TI games seem to be like that. I don't really know why, since they were designed specifically for this particular machine. Uh, but it really reduces the playability uh, when you can't go anywhere without immediately dying. This is Hunt the Whoppers, and uh, I've actually detuned your card a little bit so you can see the text again. Uh, so we'll select Easy Maze and Normal. Uh, it seems to be hard enough on that. Um, and it draws a maze and basically you move about uh, without really knowing where you're going. And uh, obviously the object of the game is to hunt the Wampus. Um, in this particular case, I've fallen into a pit, uh, which sounds like a bad thing, but then it gives you one on the tally board because you found a pit. And when you return to the game, um, you get a new maze, and you can start hunting wampuses again. Uh, so I'm really not sure I understand the objective here, uh, but it seems to be to find this guy, who is the wampus, and then you'll see on the tally board I now have one wampus on my... Uh, tally. Uh, so that's limited fun that you can have with this in my opinion, but uh, that's Hunt the Wampus. This is Tunnels of Doom, but for some reason uh, this doesn't work unless you have a cassette or a disc to go with it. Uh, so it asks you to uh, load from one of these options, and unfortunately I don't have a cassette player or a disc uh, to work with this. Uh, so, for example, if I select disk, uh, it'll ask for a file name, and then it'll just say that there was an error, wasn't able to read from that. Uh, so, Tunnels of Doom, unfortunately, isn't going to work for us today. So, this is Blasto. Uh, I'll select one player, uh, Sluggish, um, Tank Trail Several, and I'll select uh, a normal density of Mines. And basically I have a little tank here, and it seems that I can move about, although the joystick is unfortunately backwards. Uh, and I can shoot the, uh, the dark green squares, which are probably quite difficult to see. Um, I can't shoot the blue ones. If I do that, then uh, I'll immediately die. Uh, so the objective seems to be to go about in the time that's allocated and shoot as many of the green things as you possibly can uh, without shooting any of the blue ones. Uh, so this is a little bit difficult on this one because the joystick is backwards, unfortunately. 
Uh, but anyway, that seems to be all there is to the game. Uh, if you let the time run down, uh, the game just restarts. This is Parsec, and as you can see, the graphics are quite detailed and very smooth scrolling. Uh, in fact, there's actually a sprite engine in this machine. Uh, the problem I have with this particular game is that it's not particularly playable. Uh, when you shoot at the uh, alien craft, uh, they charge at you, and it's pretty much over uh, before it begins. And I think that games that, that are made artificially hard like that uh, just aren't very playable. Um, now, the reason I'm interested in this hardware is not so much because of the games that are available for it. There were only around 60 ever made. Um, the reason that I'm interested in it is just because of the history uh, that surrounds uh, the introduction of the IBM PC. Uh, this machine came out around a similar time. And uh, I was unaware of the fact that there was a parallel stream of computers uh, that uh, existed concurrently with the PC called the MSX computers. Uh, they were immensely popular, but not in the Anglosphere. Uh, so basically you saw them in Japan, um, some European countries, and South America. And actually one of the main chips in this computer was uh, part of the MSX range. Uh, so that was a sort of compatible standard that was introduced by Microsoft and ASCII Corporation uh, and lasted for an incredibly long period of time until the uh, more advanced consoles eventually wiped them out. Uh, so the chips in this ended up uh, actually contributing to the history of computing. Uh, I think you can see that uh, there's something not quite right with this game. Uh, it's really not going to be possible to shoot those fast-moving craft at the bottom there. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the main reason that I'm interested in this machine, uh, because of the technology in it. Uh, as I said before, it is a 16-bit machine, but unfortunately they connected almost everything up via uh, conversion to an 8-bit bus, which introduces additional weight states and slows everything down. Uh, so it could have been much more uh, you know, performant than it really is. Um, and it's a bit of a shame that um, you know, they cut a lot of corners uh, in the final uh, version of this. This is burger time, and the idea is that you run up and down these ladders and across the platforms and collapse the ingredients down to make burgers. And you have to avoid the monsters. Um, if you're lucky, you can get the burger ingredients to collapse on them and make them part of the sandwich. Uh, but conversely, they chase you down, and they seem to be pretty good at it, actually. And they'll make you part of their lunch. Uh, so this is actually quite a fun game, and I think it's really done well, actually. It's, it's sort of ideal for this system. Uh, it's not too fast. Uh, the graphics are good and uh, it, it's a playable concept. I'm pretty sure kids would have really enjoyed this. Uh, so uh, I think I'm going to die here, but it'll restart and uh, we'll be back with um, the same uh, layout and we get to finish it off. Uh, so the TI actually had a predecessor um, called the TI-99, uh, which came out at about $1,100 uh, instead of the 525 uh, that the TI-994A came out at. And it really was a flop. Uh, it sold almost no units because it was way too expensive. It had a non-standard basic and there was almost no software available for it. Uh, so I guess that's the main reason that this machine failed as well. There was just not enough uh, software for it. Uh, the performance issues were also uh, probably a contributor in the end uh, once it started competing against other systems. Uh, although it did have the sprite engine and a pretty decent sound chip with multiple voices and so on. Uh, so it wasn't uh, you know, a bad platform in any sense. Um, so uh, by the way I'm filming this uh, on the following day after all the other games. Uh, my hard drive died uh, overnight and I managed to rescue all of the files that I filmed yesterday except for the one for this particular game. Uh, so, uh, oh, I seem to have died again. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the next game, and we'll return back to the original footage that I had from yesterday. This is indoor soccer, and uh, I'm going to name two teams here, one and two, very creatively. Uh, and I'll make it a two-minute game. Uh, so you're always the player that's closest to the ball, and uh, so I'll kick off by pressing enter. 
and then the joystick button is basically the button that you use to kick um, and unfortunately I seem to have got an own goal there which uh, wasn't really the intention um, the uh, reason that the other players are not moving is because this is actually a two-player game and requires two joysticks uh, and believe it or not it's actually quite difficult to narrate a YouTube video whilst playing two teams simultaneously so uh, I'm actually going to be the winner by default here because the other team is not going to do any kicking at all uh, having said that it's sometimes difficult to figure out how to get the ball to be moving again um, it seems to not register the fact that my player is there. Um, but I still believe that this is a pretty playable game for the era. I'm really surprised. Um, I don't know the rules of soccer very well, so I assume that the only player that's allowed to kick this ball is uh, the red team uh, that I'm just guarding here. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to keep playing this one. Uh, that's the final cartridge that I have. Uh, I guess at this point you're wondering uh, what's on the cassettes that I got. Now, of course, I can't load those without a cassette player. Uh, many of the uh, tapes I'm not going to be able to read, uh, either because they're illegible or I don't understand the German, but uh, this one is called Super Miners. Uh, many of these tapes seem to belong to a guy called Manfred. So on this one you have Sogo, Hyperworm, uh, something Bandit. Uh, there's one called King, Hearing Test, RCL Circle, uh, looks like some kind of speaking game, and uh, perhaps a flight simulator at the end, which would be interesting. On the back, Domino, um, and I don't, can't read the rest of those. Uh, so this one has a video chooser, or something called Video Cards, uh, which is presumably for keeping videos in order. Uh, and the back has sound bark, uh, the rest of it's illegible. Uh, on this one you have uh, breakout, uh, auto recall, uh, mora, and uh, flowering plants. Uh, on this side it seems to be some kind of library software or a data system, uh, and again part of the film card uh, program. Uh, this one here is uh, auto chess. Um, there's also horses and uh, action something, which I can't read, unfortunately. Uh, the back side seems to be Tess, English, uh, work. Um, I can't read the middle one. And the last one is Eliza. I don't know if that's the famous Eliza program that's uh, also available on the PC. Uh, some of these are basic courses. Uh, so this one also has new basic for the TI-994A on the back of it. So there must have been multiple versions of basic available. Uh, this one says data cassette on one side and basic courses on the other. Uh, this one is again a games one and uh, it seems to say Panzer something. So that's a tank one presumably. Star Trek uh, and most of the rest of this is illegible. I see Robotronics and I think Fox in the hen stall. Uh, this one here uh, says all programs, uh, most of which I can't read. The words are a little bit long for my uh, limited German, unfortunately. Uh, there's some down the bottom, uh, Berlin time and know-how computer. Uh, but yeah, the rest of it is just illegible. And uh, finally, this one here is also completely illegible. The only thing I can read on that is it says automatic something or other. Uh, so that's the tapes uh, that came with this machine. But back to filming on the following day, since the end of that previous segment on the cassettes actually got cut off. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to show you was the basic and some of the manuals that came with it. Uh, the BASIC is really slow, and I can't imagine why you would want to use this, but bear in mind that this machine was really pitched as an educational machine, and a lot of the software that's out there on cartridges is actually just educational software, uh, not games. Uh, so I think in that vein, you know, having a BASIC in the machine so that kids could learn to program was certainly uh, an important selling point. The first manual is not uh, all that interesting. It's called wired remote controllers, but they just mean joysticks uh, here, and it just basically shows how to connect and calibrate the joystick uh, on the machine. Uh, it's actually in multiple languages, uh, so it's not that interesting as a manual. 
A more interesting manual is this one here, which shows uh, some of the things that were available for the TI when it came out. Uh, this was an expansion box that you could plug into it, and I assume that uh, this is a monitor that uh, would have been sold with uh, the machine. I don't know if that's a TI monitor or not. And you can see that it's a glossy brochure uh, advertising machine. It's all in German, of course. Uh, but there are some very interesting pictures in here, so obviously there's a printer on the right there. Again, I don't know if that's a TI printer. I can't actually see TI branding on it. Um, but there are lots of, uh, you know, fantastic pictures of uh, how the machine looked uh, when it was new and what you could uh, purchase with it. Uh, those joysticks are TI joysticks and I don't have those. Uh, that's the cassette recorder up in the upper left there. Uh, those are things I don't have. The uh, joystick I have is just an aftermarket one. Uh, that's what came with the machine. Uh, here's some of the programs that are available and you can see that there's some uh, educational ones in there, the music and math one, uh, but some of the others we've actually seen, the car wars uh, the football and the video chess. Um, on the next page uh, there's not very much uh, that's different, it's just more glossy advertising uh, but they advertise Pascal, uh, an assembler, logo, basic and uh, the final page is just uh, where TI is in the world. Uh, so that's that manual. And the final manual is actually uh, a basic manual and it uh, is again in German but it gives a list of all of the uh, basic commands run, by, number, break, uh, unbreak, edit, let, etc. Uh, so it's pretty comprehensive. It's a very thick uh, manual. It's uh, well over 150 pages in that. Uh, so that's the TI. Um, so that's basically all I have for this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this look back at this uh, very intriguing corner of computing history. And uh, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to put a like on it and subscribe. And we'll see you in a later video. Bye.